So based on all of your experience, the, the real question um, is that, that's unique about this is you have dealt with, you've been giving people raw food diets for a very long time. Um, I know people have come to see you who have ended up dying. So this is obviously doesn't 100% solve everything. But the question that I guess people want to know is, okay, so it sounds good. How does it work? Do When people follow this exactly like you say, do the, and if someone follows this, goes home and does exactly what you say, what's the, how well does it work? Will they lose weight? Will their cholesterol and blood sugar get stable? Will all their other health issues resolve? Or are you saying 50% of the time works, 25%? Like, how well does it work if you actually do this based on all your experience and all the people you've seen, how well does this work? So one of the questions is, there isn't the same diet for everyone. So we really actually have constitutional differences. On chromosome 19, it tells us how much protein, how much fat, and how much carbohydrate we need. So the diet actually has to be individualized. So one of the things I do when I'm doing a whole person healing is I try to figure out whether this is a person that needs a higher amount of protein, a lower amount of protein, how much fat. So we start putting the diet to their constitution. I like to tell you that was a new idea, but really in Ayurvedic medicine, that, that we've been doing it for 3,000 years. Not a big deal, kapha, pitta, vata, and variations. So one of the first questions is it has to be individualized. And that's key. When you individualize it, the next question becomes compliance. So when I individualize people's diet, we're, we're talking a 99% success rate in compliance and just being that diet. Now, my statistics, and again, I, I only tracked it intensely for three weeks, which, which is not huge compared to some of the other studies were five years, is that in three weeks, 61% of the non-insulin dependent people are cured, which means a blood sugar, fasting blood sugar less than 100 and on no medications. Now that percentage dramatically goes up over time. So if we're talking two years, we're talking about a very high, six, very high success rate, not that 61% when it's quote incurable isn't a good result, but three weeks, very short time. So over time, as people are supported and staying on a diet that's fit to their constitution, the success rate is pretty high, probably in the 90% in terms of the bigger picture, in terms of diabetes, but also general health, because we can't separate general health, longevity, well-being, optimum health from treating, uh, let's say, reversing diabetes and curing diabetes. They're, they're overlap. But first, you have to have a diet that fits the Constitution and then support in that way for people. And our, our experience uh, working with um, people in the Marshall Islands is actually quite similar. So, uh, and, and to be honest with you, I was shocked when I first started working there at how rapidly a blood sugar normalizes. And so um, it was within two weeks that almost all of our participants had to be taken off their medication or they would have been in having hypoglycemic reactions constantly. So we would cut their medication in half almost immediately in half again within a week and they were off it within two weeks. And so I think with type two diabetes, it's more rare that a person doesn't respond to this kind of program than does. Almost everybody can resolve type two diabetes unless uh, they have, I mean, there's a test you can do, uh, C-peptide where, you know, you see if there's any remaining functioning beta cells and, and there's some people that have much more serious disease than others. But even for those people, they can recover health tremendously by changing their diet. So we are a snacking uh, nation. We like to snack. And you know why we like to snack is because our blood sugar is all over the place and uh, we're not satisfied. We're not satiated. We, we didn't eat well. I mean, I was brought up on uh, meat, and, uh, meat and potato and it doesn't fill you up. That's not the protein that's easy to digest. That's not accepted by your body like a bowl of sprouts and vegetables. So you're constantly hungry. 
and you can eat and eat and eat all day long. Well, actually, when you're starting with diabetes, type 1 or 2, you need to snack. You need to actually eat more often. So what a lot of our guests have to do at the Institute, they actually they eat uh, the breakfast, which is sprouted grains, and then, and, and then we have green drink, and they have their supplementation, and then maybe they have a protein shake, which is no way, no way, right? And then uh, they have, um, then they have th an extra meal. So they actually, uh, in a package, they save food for later. And f same after dinner, they might need it. So they find that they can easier fix their insulin balance during the day too. So that's the only snacking that we are for. But most people snack on chips and cookies and you know whatever comes their way. And we're doing that because there is a reason, because we are not filled with nourishment. Our bodies are not satisfied. So that, that works for a lot of people too, but good food that you snack on. When you, when you start to look at this whole thing, it's, it's uh, amazing uh, that we've worked our way into a position we created a non-existent disease in a century. And I didn't know that number. I know in 1900 there weren't reported cases, but there was one reported case in the United States in 1920, one right. reported case. Right. Uh, we, we, I would get on my knees and pray the rest of my life for that again. How many people are suffering? How many people are in pain? How many people don't even know they have diabetes today? They end up with a heart attack or a stroke before they know. So here's what I'd like to comment, what I'd like to add to this conversation. That the same exact diet we give you for diabetes, we give you in our weight loss program. The difference is we work you out like a, a lunatic, too. Uh, so, you know, we see such rapid reduction in weight loss. There's not a better weight loss program in the world than the Living Food Program at Hippocrates. And we have trainers that get you out there and they have fun, at that type of thing. So, the same thing that creates diabetes creates fat in the body. Uh, the same thing that creates diabetes feeds cancer. Not maybe, it feeds cancer. Blood sugar feeds cancer. Um, there's not a legitimate group of people anymore that doesn't underst they don't understand that except people who don't read the current literature on that one. Uh, and I would tell you, when we put people on this diet, we see radical change in neurological diseases, everything from dementia down to multiple sclerosis and ALS and you know, muscular diseases. Uh, Parkinsonian diseases, and of course we do other things. We use hyperbaric chambers, IVs of whole food supplementation, you know, amino acid drips, whole food B, uh, B12 injections, and psychotherapy. The most important thing I wish I had, because I kept cheating on sugar and cheating on sugar and cheating on sugar. I'm lucky I wasn't a diabetic. Like my mother died as a result of diabetes. My brothers, but one died as a result of diabetes and a fatty liver because he ate so much sugar. And my other brother became an alcoholic because the next step in, in eating sugar is you take booze. It's liquid sugar. So the concept that it's genetic that you become an alcoholic is completely, absolutely wrong. You become, at 12, 13, 15, when you take your first drink, an alcoholic when it burns your mouth because it's liquid sugar. That's why you become that. So it's all pretty much synonymous. All of these things go to the same result. And the last thing I'd like to say is psychotherapy is important on this. So getting groups, I, you know, and I'm a big fan of AA. You don't have to be an alcoholic to go there. It gives you discipline. And if you're, if you're struggling as a diabetic, sign up for AA. They're free all over the world. You can go there and go in and tell them that I'm a sugar addict. I'm a, I'm a, a fat addict. And if you have the support, because likely your family is eating the same as you, so you don't have the support. Find friends who have healed. The best way to do this is find friends that have healed these problems. And they're all over the place. And last thing I'd like to say, although this is a high mountain to climb, when you get to the top, you see a lot more than you've ever seen in your life before. Life becomes crystal clear and filled and open and happy and fulfilling and you now become a functional member of the culture and society. Uh, one little caveat to it is sugar. He had me both activate dopamine, which 
feed your pleasure centers. So part of the transition away from sugar, really away from meat, is beginning to involve yourself in activities in a lifestyle that increases your dopamine, which indeed is the live food lifestyle, which obviously does include a lot of exercise as well. So it's just beginning to understand because actually about a third of the alcoholics actually have a genetic defect where they don't produce enough dopamine. So give them things that produce dopamine. Exercise, joy, happiness, all the different things, including a live food diet, which definitely increases your neurotransmitter production and your dopamine production. So we want to give people uh, positive reward centers. Believe it or not, at least 90% of alcoholics have blood sugar difficulties, particularly hypoglycemia. It says there's a very close connection there. Thank you.